repeat. Well, uh, I was going to say good morning, but good afternoon, depending on where you are joining us from today. Uh, welcome to uh, Whiteboard Advisors, our reopening webinar, what will college look like in the COVID-19 era. I'm really excited for all of you to join us today. Um, some of you may remember um, back in March, we actually spoke with a number of higher ed leaders who were grappling with the unprecedented challenges in response to the pandemic. And of course, a rapidly evolving set of facts have resulted in some pretty immediate decisions um, around institution closures, um, in-person learning, shifting to remote learning, and also just new hybrid models of engagement uh, that have emerged in the last few months. And so today we are reconvening uh, a conversation with some new faces, um, not to our webinars and not to many of you, but perhaps new together to this conversation about what institutions and systems are thinking about as we talk about reopening, whether to reopen, how to reopen, especially to in-person learning. So I'm thrilled that you're able to join us today. I'm Allison Griffin, Senior Advisor with Whiteboard Advisors. I am joined today um, by four esteemed colleagues. Uh, Dr. Paul Dosal, Vice President for Student Success at the University of South Florida. Uh, Mr. John Marshall, who's the Vice President for Student Affairs at Colorado Mesa University. Dr. Kim Hunter-Reed, the Commissioner of Higher Education in the state of Louisiana, and Mr. Jeff Salingo, an author of Who Gets In and Why? A Year Inside College Admissions. Really thrilled to have the four of you with us today. I'm going to turn um, first to Jeff. Uh, Jeff, you have been tracking what has been happening across the country um, with regard to higher ed, reopening, closures, new models, um, in March, as I mentioned, we had talked with a number of higher ed leaders across the country um, in response to the pandemic as it was unfolding. What are you learning as you are talking with higher ed leaders about their plans to reopen in the fall? Well, Allison, first of all, it's great to be here and it's great to be here with this uh, great panelist. I hope that everyone out there is, uh, is doing well, um, as well as can be expected uh, this summer. And I think, Allison, really it's kind of a, a, an ever-changing situation. Uh, as it has been in many ways since since March, I think that when we first met uh, back in uh, in the spring, uh, you know, we thought that this would be something that would last maybe a couple of weeks at first, right? And then, in fact, many institutions didn't even postpone or move the entire spring semester to remote until we were a couple of weeks into really the surge of the the pandemic. Then we moved that for the entire spring. Then soon spring turned to summer, um, but nobody really even wanted to talk about the fall. Uh, back then. Then we started talking about the fall and many institutions, and in fact, I just wrote about this in the Chronicle this morning, put back their reopening task forces in place, right? And you saw most institutions, and in fact, uh, you know, the Chronicle on par as part of their tracker still shows that most institutions planning to uh, reopen in the, for in-person instruction in the fall. But what you're now seeing over the last couple of weeks are a number of institutions that had already announced they're going to be back in person in the fall, now start to reverse some of those decisions. You're starting to see many more institutions go to a much more of a hybrid model uh, and really kind of doubling down on the online component of that, of that uh, hybrid model. And so I feel that over the next couple of weeks, um, we're gonna see more of that. We're gonna see more fully online or more hybrid, probably with more of an online component um, although this continues to be somewhat regional, right? It's, it, it depends on what's happening in certain states um, and in, in terms of certain governors and what they're doing in terms of their reopening plans. But I will tell you that in July, whatever today is, middle of July, I did not expect to be here. Uh, if you asked me about this back in the spring, I really thought that the fall would be, you know, kind of some online, but mostly face to face. But now I think we're going to start to see the opposite of that. Interesting. Well, thank you. I'm going to turn to our both state and campus leaders and get their perspectives. And Kim, I'm going to start with you. Um, would you talk a little bit about the decision points that um, you have considered, the commission has considered, as you and institutions look toward fall? Um, specifically, how many campuses are reopening to in-person learning and how many will have hybrid or even fully remote experiences for students? Sure, uh, thank you so much. Delighted to join all of you. 
Uh, at this point, I certainly have to echo Jeff's uh, comments, so much uncertainty. Uh, but right now, I would say as of today, we probably will be a higher, a hybrid higher education state. Uh, lots of conversations about in-person, about remote learning, about the challenge of connectivity and digital divide. Uh, we began, uh, I, I guess, in March, you know, as soon as we had our first case, it was the first day of the legislative session, March 8th or March 9th. Uh, we, within two weeks, went completely remote. Uh, and started talking about digital inclusion and this challenge. Uh, we had a number of uh, Zoom webinars, if you will, with all of higher ed. So we had an all higher ed planning meeting in early June to talk through the state's guidance, uh, connect to each phase of where we are in the state. So, you know, right now we're in phase two and holding. We have a statewide mask requirement. Uh, we've talked to higher education, public and private, two year, four year proprietary student leaders, student health centers, regional medical directors, trying to make sure everyone understood all the scenarios, all the gating criteria around hospitalization and ventilators and all of those things that are driving decisions that certainly impact higher ed. Uh, so we have continued to have those conversations uh, as institutions are working to ensure learning never stops, right? That students know that we don't want them to defer their dreams we want to do it and we must do it safely, but it's just a question at this point of delivery model and certainly a big question about how do we address the connectivity that has to occur when you are in a world of remote learning from P16 and beyond. So those are the conversations that we've been having, certainly using our CDC guidelines, talking with our public health officials, uh, and trying to make sure that we're lockstep with them and as they learn more, we're sharing more uh, in terms of making decisions. Our students want to get back. Some of them are very concerned about what remote learning looks like uh, and certainly want to make sure that parents and students have the assurances that we are here to support them and to do well uh, as we continue to support their, their work. Excellent. Thank you for that for that overview and certainly for your leadership over the, fast, the last number of months. I'm gonna to turn to John Marshall um, with Colorado Mesa University. John, um, uh, through an interview actually with uh, President Tim Foster uh, this month in Forbes, we learned a lot about the Safe Together, Strong Together protocols and initiative that have been developed at CMU and you are co-leading that reopening plan. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about um, the plan, how CMU reached the decision to reopen to in-person learning in the fall, and what are some of the most significant considerations you're thinking as you welcome, thinking about as you're welcoming students back to campus? Yeah, thanks so much, Allison. Appreciate you having me. Um, so the first thing I guess I would lead with is I think for those of us that have been neck deep in this from the get-go is I, I think we've all developed a very healthy dose of humility through this process that um, every day changes new information and just recognizing that despite our best efforts and all the, the work that so many people are doing across the country in higher ed, um, we're laboring to get this right. But this is not simple and, and I think recognizing that on the way in. So if you rewind in our experience, we serve a population um, here in Western Colorado of about two in three of our students are either going to be first in their family to go to college, Pell eligible, or a student of color. And what we found in that spring term, as we did what everybody else did, right, we, we scrambled quickly, just Herculean effort on behalf of so many good faculty members who, who did a great job taking these courses they weren't planning on online. Um, but, but despite all of that good work, I think what we heard from our most vulnerable students was it did not go well. It, it was not a good experience and for a whole variety of reasons, um, some of the barriers and some of the challenges that we're all familiar with that our most vulnerable students face um, maybe came or crystallized is maybe the best way to say it. So for us, I think this whole conversation starts with a moral imperative. How is it we are going to continue to push forward to support those students throughout this and not have them take a time out in their lives? I think, I'm not sure, Kim, the way you said it was more artful than the way I am, but the, 
this idea that we're not going to ask them to defer their dreams for um, a year. This is we we got to figure this out. So recognizing again in humility that we're not going to be able to control a global pandemic. We can only work to try and um, plan for our students and our campus. But we also recognize that we are in a different space than other places. So Jeff, you you started off this idea that we're all facing different realities. And I think that is the right way to view this challenge. And it's not even within certain states. And Colorado is a good example. The front range of Colorado has been far more impacted than we have in Western Colorado. Our two week prevalence rate has been hovering at 2%. In fact, these last few days, it actually has dropped below 2% here in Mesa County. And so it's, we are all facing different realities and I think vital that we, um, that we respond in that regard. So for us, I think we've really tried to be thoughtful about what do the conditions dictate on the ground? How are we communicating with our State Department of Higher Ed, with our State Department of Public Health, and our local public health agencies? Um, and really, we based a plan around that, creating an executive committee that was born in um, health experts, public health experts, and policymakers so that we know higher ed, but we're not going to take a step that is not really in step with our public health partners. And so really trying to tie those things together, which um, up to this point has has worked pretty well. Great. And we'll, um, we'll dive into elements of that plan as we get our discussion underway, but I'd like to shift to Paul. Um, Paul, you have dedicated your career to supporting students in their success, both in and outside of the classroom. And so I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how the University of South Florida has responded to student needs during the pandemic and your thoughts about higher ed reopening to in-person learning. What supports really need to be in place to support students both in but also outside of the classroom um, as we look toward fall? Sure. Thanks, Allison. Well, I think when um, this first hit, first hit us all back in, in March, our first concern was uh, for the immediate needs of our students. And so our efforts were focused then on ensuring that students um, had a laptop so that they could continue in the remote environment, uh, but also making sure they had housing. And so while we had to shut down, some students had to remain on campus. They had no other place to go. Then we had to make sure that they had enough food. As you know, across the country, we're struggling with food insecurity and housing insecurity. And so one of our early efforts was to make sure our food pantries were fully stocked. So we, we did that. And, and also uh, we wanted to make sure that when the CARES Act money came through that we got it out as fast as possible. And that was the intent of the CARES Act, to get it into the pockets of students ASAP. And so I'm really proud of how quickly we, we got that out there. But then uh, once we, we met those immediate needs, we started to shift gears a little bit and started to focus more on, well, how can we continue to promote their success even in this ultra challenging environment? Because it still makes sense to keep them on track to graduate with their degree in, in a timely way. And so we, we wanted to make sure all the elements were in place that we could continue to deliver the services they need in the remote environment and now as we're planning to reopen to make sure that they had all the supports they needed and we mean and understand the full range of supports they need it's not just the academic needs and in this environment the need for emotional well-being and and counseling and health counseling and even student success coaching is is more necessary than ever so we we need to make sure that when we reopen that we have all those elements in place for in-person services, and we are gonna have some students coming into offices, but even uh, be prepared to deliver high quality telehealth services as well. Uh, they're gonna need that. They need the full range of support services more than ever. Uh, I'm pleased to say that we had all the elements in place already. So I, I think we're meeting the needs of our students, but right now we're at a critical decision point. I think we have a whole lot of students who are eager to get back to campus. Think about it from their perspective. Many of them have been home for four months and they've all lost a degree of their independence. They're ready and eager perhaps to get back to the campus environment and resume something close to normal for themselves as well. So we're doing our best as everyone on this panel is to provide a safe reopening for our students, most likely in all cases 
it's a mix. It's a hybrid. Uh, but I think we've learned how to do it and do it pretty well. That's great. Thank you very much. I am, I'm seeing some questions starting to pop up in our Q&A and they actually tie into some comments that our panelists have made and some questions that I have. So I'm going to start to um, weave some of this together and turn it into a bit more of a conversation um, amongst the five of us and, and, our, and our listeners here today. But to that point about um, institutions responding to student needs, there's a question in the chat, but I also had a question about you know, what sort of technologies or methods or modes are you using to get information from students? How are you communicating with them to understand their needs, perhaps outside of just the academic context where they might be interfacing with faculty? Um, are you having surveys, focus groups? What, what, what's in place uh, for you all? Or what are you reading about? Yeah, we, we've done a variety of surveys uh, of students, which I'm guessing most of my colleagues have been doing, but we've been doing surveys of students on a pretty regular basis, uh, trying to better understand both the in-class, how's the online learning going, um, to, to Paul's point, you know, how are you doing outside of the classroom, how are your basic needs being met, a variety of those kind of things. And then we've been also surveying parents to try and get a better sense of them, you know, this idea of parents as partners, if, if we are going to reopen safely in the fall, what are the key elements that you are most concerned about? We know what public health advisors are telling us. We know what students are telling us. What does mom and dad think about this? So we've, we've spent some time and just got some really valuable data, um, even in the last week, about some of those parent attitudes, which, is, which has helped inform our steps at this point. Paul, are there tools or, or systems that you're using? Yes. Uh, some of the same surveys and focus groups, we've done oh. those as well. Um, but uh, we've also done town hall forums with students. And you know what, uh, students and their parents have been telling us regularly uh, what they have in mind, what they want and need. You know, there's no, no shortage of emails and phone calls that we've been getting over the last few months. Uh, they're quite anxious, obviously, out there. And uh, so we've been hearing from them regularly. I, I, would add, yes. I would add that um, one of the things that I think was very effective when we looked at the data of how many students withdrew in the spring, we found that 90% uh, of the institutions reported that their number was higher for continuation than uh, the previous year. And the reason was they did a lot of call centers. They did a lot of conversations, reaching out to students, trying to understand barriers to success, getting laptops to them, et cetera. So I think that has made a difference, uh, Allison. For mm -hmm. us at the Board of Regents, we're lucky because we host the Council of Student Body Presidents. So we have access to all the SGA presidents and we've done Zoom conversations with them to go over the reopening plan uh, for the state to answer their questions, to talk about uh, the state of civil unrest, racial concerns, just a number of things so that we're hearing directly from them about their concerns and what they're excited about in terms of getting back. I think Paul's exactly right. Students are excited to get back. The question is, can we get them back safely? And I will share one major concern that I have in Louisiana. When we look at our numbers currently, our 18 to 28, 29 year olds is the number that is spiking right now in our state. Uh, and so, and most of it is social spread. So I think about the fact that our institutions can do everything exactly right, spend millions of dollars more on cleaning, have, you know, reduced density, have all the classrooms right, have grab and go lunches. But if students wander away from campus to parties, if they're not wearing their masks, taking this seriously, you can have outbreaks on campus, even though the campus has done everything they could to keep students safe. So I want to recognize, and I think we have to continue to talk to students about their responsibility in helping to keep themselves and their campus community as safe as possible. And Allison, just one point uh, yeah. that I think Kim brought up that I think is great. I mean, the surveys are fantastic, right? But, uh, you know, survey responses are what they are. Uh, this is also fast changing, right? So something somebody tells you this week uh, might be something different in a couple of weeks to the same question. Um, I think the data piece that Kim brought up, right? I, I know a number of institutions have really strong institutional data. They knew a lot about what uh, worked and what didn't in the spring. Uh, you know, all the way down to, you know, who signed on to classes, when, how often, things like that. I think that what, if anything that is going to be good that comes out of this pandemic in terms of higher ed, 
it's that we really have to kind of double down on student level data uh, because at the end of the day, that's what's going to tell us what behavior is like. Um, and I think those institutions that had invested in that digital backbone in the spring now have a treasure trove of data that they're able to help plan for the fall, especially when it comes to remote learning. What worked, what didn't. Absolutely. No, I think that's, I think the point about data and also the point about uh, the student social networks are two points that we haven't read as much about. Um, I will say, John, just to turn to you, I know a little bit about the CMU plan and the fact that you all are planning to return to in-person learning. I know you've given some thought to um, how to keep students connected, perhaps in, I think they were called sort of like family pods. Can you talk a little bit about that and um, how you plan to implement that, uh, that approach on campus this fall? Yeah, you know, early on, I think like most of us, we were, you know, reflexively thinking, well, how do we keep these students uh, six feet apart? How do, how do we keep all these kids uh, distanced? And as it turns out, 19 year olds don't wanna be six feet apart, right? And our epidemiology team at the public health department and, and some of our on-campus and medical experts said, you know, instead of thinking about this as a six-foot social distancing, we really need to be thinking about these as family units and, and really trying to design our work around this idea. So CMU, we're the Mavericks, and, and we have this idea of Mavily, um, and this concept of, of these small family units. And so we've demised that, for example, in our residence halls, Every residence hall style is different, right? So you got an apartment unit. Well, there's your Mavily, okay? Those, you're gonna share a bathroom and a kitchen and just like you do at home, you're not socially distancing from those folks who you're sharing a dining room table with. And then uh, in a more traditional style hall, it might be a wing on a floor where you share a couple of bathrooms and those become your family units and, and really designing our approach around that. And as you start to think about the entirety of the campus experience, these family units um, clustering where students can be more like themselves, where they can, um, you know, they can socialize together, they can eat together, they can study together, they can do all these things together as a family, but recognizing that, that um, y you've got to be really thoughtful with your peers as you're, you know, sort of wandering out into somebody else's family unit. And, and going back to those, those items of respect and caution and masking up and making sure we're keeping distancing and all those things outside your family unit. And the other thing it's going to help us do on the contact tracing side is allow us to really understand if you've got somebody that's hot in a family unit, you got to isolate that whole family unit. And so instead of trying to um, figure out spread with an R-naught value off the charts because who knows who they're with, we're, we are planning to and, and, you know, talk to me in six months and find out how we worked. Um, use, utilize this family unit as one of the ways to help cluster focus and improve our contact tracing in addition. And then of course on the front end we'll do baseline testing and surveillance testing through the course of the semester. But the family units will again help inform our surveillance testing because um, we'll be testing by family units so the methodology will change based on that kind of cornerstone strategic decision. Great. Thank you for walking through that. Um, that's, uh, I've, I've read a little bit about that um, a similar scenario playing out on a few campuses, but appreciate you walking through that uh, with our audience. I wanna shift gears just a little bit and talk about financial impacts. So much has been written um, about the balance between the financial impacts of the pandemic on institutions and the public health imperative, obviously, to ensure that students and faculty and staff remain safe and healthy. So what are some of the considerations that each of you or your institutions or the system, Kim, Jeff, what you've heard from others are really wrestling with? Um, and how have you been thinking about that balance of the financial impact to the institution or the system and the public, the public health concerns? I'm happy to call on anyone who. <laughs> so I'll, I'll start, I had to try to figure out how to unmute real quick. Um, so, you know, when you think about the fact in our state that 70% of the cost of how, you know, how, how to pay for college is borne by students and families, there is tremendous anxiety 
around are students going to show up, right? And are people going to enroll and are people going to come? And then you balance that with the tremendous cost of doing this right in terms of stepped up safety, cleaning, all of those things. So, you know, we have continued to talk with the legislature and others about the importance of this investment in higher ed. Uh, CARES Act dollars were used over $100 million to minimize cuts to higher education in this legislative session. And what I've said to our leaders is, this is not a victory lap, it's a planning lap. Because if the economy continues to slow or to sour, then we're going to be in a situation where we may have uh, cuts to higher education. We may be back where we have been for a, a decade plus in Louisiana. Uh, so I do think that people are wrestling with this conversation of, uh, you know, I was talking to our community college system, for example, they said, you know, in some places, 50% of the students show up one week before school starts in terms of decision making adults, uh, 27, 28 plus. Now you factor in the fact that perhaps they've lost a part-time job or two and their children may not be in school full-time. And so the, the level of uncertainty and anxiety around affordability is very high in our state and many others. So I think there are you know, significant challenges on both sides of the house, making sure that safety is first, but recognizing that you know, in states where you have significant disinvestment and state resources are not there, uh, this financial reality is tied to enrollment, uh, and we've got to make sure that we're safely enrolling students, that they have options for remote, remote or hybrid learning, but that clearly is part of the decision making and the discussions that are happening at every kitchen table and in every finance office in our state. Most definitely. Thank you, Kim. Paul, were you gonna were you gonna chime in? Sure. I think we all have to take uh, in the the financial implications of what we're doing. Uh, we are, after all, a large employer at USF. We're one of the largest in the county, and so if we can't reopen safely and return to normal, there's going to be an e economic hit on top of everything else that's going on. And of course, our political leadership, our elected representatives are very much interested in having us reopen in some way. So we are too. Uh, we think it's in the best interest of everybody to reopen. But boy, we all have to balance this very carefully. It's not going to help anybody out if we reopen only to have to shut down the next week. Right? And so we have to do what's in the best interest of, of everybody and, and protect the safe and health of everybody. It, it's not at all easy. This is the toughest times I've seen in higher ed for a long, long time. Also, I want to I want to take a slightly different take on that um, on that question because obviously uh, the the short term uh, challenges that Paul talks about uh, uh, in terms of the of the institution uh, the short term challenges that Kim talks about in terms of state budgets they're all real right this is going to be this is going to be a brutal you know I, I got my start in higher education covering uh, state higher education uh, and state higher education policy this is going to be a brutal year we all know that uh, coming up. But I do want to look at um, kind of the longer term, slightly longer term issues, uh, particularly on the public higher ed side, because when you think about, um, you know, regional public colleges, which are really kind of the, the backbone and the workhorse of, of American higher, uh, public higher education, right? Everybody talks about the, the flagships, right? But it's the regional publics that, in essence, when you put them all together, uh, enroll a larger percentage of undergraduates, uh, particularly they're, you know, kind of the regional workhorses in many cases, but they also um, educate our teachers, our nurses, our public health workers, our uh, law enforcement uh, folks, and just think about all the issues happening right now. So, you know, we're obviously having a huge discussion right now in this country about uh, the future of, of law enforcement. Uh, we're having uh, big conversations about K through 12 and not only about this fall, but what's gonna happen in the future. I actually think there may be a lot of teachers retiring now coming this fall. So it opens up incredible opportunity for our schools on that front. Um, and it also opens up an opportunity in terms of thinking about public health education and, um, and nursing education and healthcare education in general. So on those three big academic areas, uh, law enforcement, K through 12 education and public health and healthcare in general, I think that yes, the short term is gonna be really tough on public higher ed, but going forward, I think that the opportunities 
for our institutions to be at the forefront of those conversations at the state level. And in some ways, it may help our public institutions get funding that they normally otherwise wouldn't get. Because it could potentially open them up to new, you know, as states talk about uh, reforming policing, for example, as they talk about what are we gonna do about K through 12 schools going forward. There's all these new revenue streams that may be open because of those issues that potentially higher ed could tap into. Yes, definitely bad in the short term. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to make it any better than I think it's going to be, but I'm also trying to think of, to make this a little hopeful about what's next. Yeah, Jeff, I might just camp on that for one quick second. I think we've, we have seen that exact conversation unfolding in our region where all of a sudden you are reminded how vital the, the core of your mission is. Who are those folks? I mean, how many of us uh, could have named on one hand the epidemiologists in our community prior to this? And all of a sudden these folks are, are front and center and recognizing how reliant we all are on these public health agencies and all the folks in the public health universe and now here's this great opportunity for us to be educating the epidemiology teams and public health professionals of tomorrow and reminding our students boy you can go two directions here right we, we're all nervous we're all we're all scared in this moment and uncertainty but the other side is there is this hopeful future that you can be part of the solution here to help us figure out where we head from here so i think that's a it's an important conversation to continue to have with students to remind them why it is we're in this business. I think that's absolutely right. And I think Jeff, to Jeff's point, it, it, it's sort of a hearkening to us around case making, right? To say, uh, you know, when you think about being in this fight, if you want people back to work, ready to go, upskilled, reskilled, we do that, right? We are focused on short-term credentials, longer-term credentials, stackable credentials. If you want to think about the research and the science and the testing and the tracing and, the, and what's going to happen to get us out of this fight, we do that. That's what higher education does. And so I do think it is an opportunity for us to continue to talk about the value proposition when it comes to evolving our states and our nation into where we want to be, disruption, innovation, uh, responsiveness uh, to a resilient Louisiana, resilient country, those are the things that we absolutely bring to the table. And Allison, I don't, I don't want to get too optimistic here with Jeff, but uh... No, please. We need a dose of optimism. We, we do. I'll, I'll give myself that luxury for a few minutes. But please. some of the see, things I see uh, moving into place now might stay with us over the long haul. For example, the hybrid courses that our professors are now developing sound great to me from a student success and a pedagogical perspective. Why haven't we been posting lecture capture online and then bring them into the classroom only for active learning sessions. I love it, right? That, that's a great pedagogical strategy. I'd like to see that strengthened all along. Why haven't we been doing more telehealth counseling anyway? So some of these things I think will stay with us for a while and they should. And so now we should be asking ourselves, why haven't we been doing this before, right? And I think it's partly because higher ed, education in general perhaps is just so slow to move, right? Mm -hmm. But now we're moving. We've been forced to move. The fire is lit underneath us. I like the way you framed that. Um, and I will not say this as eloquently as um, our colleague, uh, Mike Krause from Tennessee, Kim's uh, fellow Shio um, in Tennessee. But he had made a statement, I think, on social media a number of weeks ago that was talking, talking more about the policies that we have, you know, waived or um, paused or even you know, repealed altogether um, in order to make the last four months work. And I think the, the point was, why would we ever go back and reinstate some of those policies that we found in this moment are not working? And so I think, Paul, you've added the second layer to that, which is we've actually 
um, identified things that may be working really well for students and learners? And is there an opportunity to embrace those new models or partnerships or collaborations um, as we move forward? And so maybe to that point, I'd be curious um, from each of you, from your different vantage points, have you been involved with institutions or Paul or John as institutional leaders that are sharing ideas and actually collaborating in this moment to figure out you know, what's working on your campus. How might that be leveraged or scaled on my campus? Um, can some of you talk about uh, about where you've seen collaboration um, emerge over the last few months? I think one of the one of the um, what sort of imminent challenges that some of the institutions in Colorado have been trying to kick around. I wouldn't say it's on the front burner, but it is one of the considerations, which is athletics. You've got all these student athletes who um, would, would really like to continue competing. And there's a variety of sports and a variety of considerations and all those things. And one of the things it has prompted is conversations around how do you, how do you effectively screen, not just for our students, but across all these institutions, because it, it doesn't help you to do a great job at your institution if you're um, if you're engaged with and, and traveling to campuses that are doing something totally different right and so it's really challenged us i think to to do exactly what you're describing which is one figure out the problem solving but two figure out problem solving in a collaborative way that we can all get on board with with a whole variety of different peers to come to some agreements on things that work from a resource policy student-centered i mean all these considerations um, and it's just going to force our hand to get better. Whether or not we are able to figure out sports or not, it's going to force us to get better, and I think in a variety of those ways and, and collaborate more in those areas. And Allison, uh, USF, we certainly collaborate with our colleagues throughout the state and, and country whenever we can. We've got some formal partnerships like the Florida Consortium of Metropolitan Research Universities, which is a partnership between USF and University of Central Florida and Florida International. And so I speak regularly with my colleagues there and we share best practices and, and problems. And uh, heck, we also have organized a National Student Success Conference every year and it's coming up again in February, though we're going online and we happen to have a great keynote speaker, a guy named Jeff Salingo will be one of our keynoters uh, come February. But I, I think collaborations like these are, are important for all of us. This is how we learn and grow. Yeah, in, in fact, Allison, I, I think that uh, collaboration, which has been kind of the coin of the realm in, in higher ed for so long, and I think that people collaborated within their state, um, they maybe have collaborated within their similar type of institution. But, you know, something I've written about over the last couple of years is we started to see an increase in institutions facing common problems. I think what you know, John mentioned about, you know, just athletics, for example, I think coming out of this, we might just start to see new types of collaboration around common problems at institutions. We've seen this, for example, in student success. Uh, you know, things like the University Innovation Alliance, I think is a great example of that. And so I think we're gonna see more of those because now what we have seen, especially during this pandemic, is that higher ed and, um, and collaboration doesn't know state borders. Uh, it doesn't know time zones. Um, you don't have to be in a physical location to do things together. And, uh, and I, I'm hopeful that um, institutions for survival, I think in some cases they might do it, they're gonna do much more collaboration about common issues that they're facing together. I would just add, you know, as Paul mentioned uh, and, and John, we certainly have collaboration that we're seeing around research and the specific uh, COVID challenge, but I would say our biggest statewide collaboration right now is around digital inclusion. We've surveyed our campuses multiple times. We have a digital inclusion committee uh, we did receive governor's emergency funds from CARES Act to support uh, faculty professional development around remote learning on every campus in our state. And so people have been sharing what that professional development looks like. Uh, how do we do that? How do we do it well? How do we get better? What worked? What didn't? As I mentioned with the um, learning management systems analysis, with the call centers. And so I do see some of that robust conversation that we really must have because you know you can't think about a hybrid model you can't really think about remote learning if we're going to in fact separate the haves and the have nots even more have even bigger equity gaps 
because we don't have connectivity for everyone. So therefore education is not available to everyone. And so I do think we have to keep talking about this challenge, keep leaning into how to solve this. And maybe that's one silver lining that will come from this, that we will have disruption in our delivery model, but that we'll get to a point where we erase the digital divide and we try to close some of these equity gaps, which we absolutely must do. Kim, um, picking up on that, you actually joined us um, on a webinar a couple of months ago with officials from the U.S. Departments of Education and Labor, and we were talking about federal support for the pandemic response and what and what states were doing and you offered that perspective but you really responded to what um, those officials were laying out and so at, at that time i think we focused specifically on federal cares act funds how they were being leveraged by institutions and states to provide those just in time supports so take us like where are we now a couple months later where do uh, specifically in Louisiana but if you could maybe speak a little bit to where do states and institutions really stand in order to address what you just raised really fundamental issues around equity and the digital divide what level or degree of resource is still needed to, to do that so I do think that uh, we are seeing um, you know uh, institutions and systems leaning into this work. I'll tell you, for example, I had a conversation this morning with uh, Dr. Belton, who is the president of the HBCU uh, Southern University system, the only uh, HBCU system um, in the country. And they are using their CARES Act dollars and other dollars to ensure that every incoming freshman has technology, right? Has the laptop and the internet connectivity at a much reduced rate. Uh, and so they're trying to think about how to address that issue. Paul mentioned CARES Act dollars, emergency funds going to students around food and childcare, just basic needs. So I think that the dollars that were available to states and to students help to address immediate emergency needs. There certainly were not enough dollars for us to turn the battleship and change the system and the structure in a way that erases gaps. And so now I think it's a conversation with Congress and others to say, what more can we do, right? We had an immediate emergency. We've tried to address the emergency as best we can. Now we need to make sure that we have the foundational supports that allow us to continue to evolve our system in a way that is much more student-centered, much more student success-centered. Uh, and that's the work we have to do. M most of our institutions had more expense than they had CARES Act dollars. A lot of them immediately put those dollars towards reimbursement for uh, meal plans and for um, housing. Uh, and so now they've got to figure out how to do this hybrid model safely, how to clean and how to do all those things and how to support faculty and professional development and devices and on and on it goes. So I do think there is additional resource that will allow us to transform the system. But we also have a responsibility, as Jeff knows, to speak to what do you get for the additional dollars? Right? How do we know that the return on investment is really going to evolve a system in a way that allows more people to have access and more people to have success? Absolutely. Well, thank you for that. And I, um, I think to that point, there's, there's a question in the chat and I also have a question around the number of platforms um, and that have offered resources for all higher ed institutions um, for students to be able to take courses through those platforms. In your experience, either are your institutions um, or are those that you work with making use of those? Are they a viable model moving forward? Or do you see that campuses are really standing up their own online learning systems? Uh, Allison, I think, it, and I'll let uh, the others also answer, but, um, you know, I think there's a, it's kind of a mix of, of, of doing this. I think that higher ed's uh, bias has always been to try to do this on its own. Um, and, and I think that those institutions that need to move fast and further right now are Outside because it's the only way they can do this um, quickly, especially for the fall semester. So I think we're seeing kind of a mix of, of ways of, of doing this, but I think this is one area where, again, I think kind of institutional cooperation, what we were talking about earlier, this idea of, of sharing, the idea that there is, um, you know, that everybody has to do Econ 101 
uh, you know, an online econ 101 course, right, is just kind of ridiculous when you think about it online, right? So why can't we share kind of a, maybe, you know, where a professor on a local campus says, you know, 90% of that content is perfect and I'll add 10% to it, uh, rather than everybody try to do 100% of their own content uh, for some of these courses. And this is where I think sharing of resources going forward is going to be absolutely uh, critical. Thank you. Um, are there other comments on that, or I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna keep shifting gears. Okay. Um, so, and this goes back to the online, remote, hybrid conversation. Um, you know, a lot of surveys recently have shown that students may not be as enthusiastic about a move from in-person to online experience. I think, Paul, you, you raised that at the very beginning of, of our discussion. Um, but per, in particular, um, they're less excited to pay the same price as they may have paid for a campus-based experience. Um, I think we've done a really nice job of actually holding the, the term online education sort of sacred in this conversation. And we've talked about remote and virtual learning. I think online education is really a term of art, um, if you will. And so when we think about the transition to in-person to remote learning, um, what are you hearing from students, directly from students about that remote learning experience? Um, are there ways, are they bringing ideas to the table? Are they engaging with faculty um, in ways to build out courses or, or share information? I'd be curious for the student perspective on, on their remote learning experience. Yeah, I think back in, in March, the, the end of the spring semester, when we were delivering remote instruction, and I'm glad you're making the distinction between remote and online a world of difference there. And so we had to transfer to remote in a hurry. And we definitely heard from students and their parents, definitely, that they didn't think the quality was what they expected. And certainly if they're out of state or international is paying a higher price, they questioned the value there. So uh, luckily for USF, uh, even before COVID, about 30% of our credit hours were taken online anyway. We had invested in, in innovative education, and online classes were already a pretty significant part of our delivery. So we've just had to ramp that up now and, and, and do so to deliver the high quality educational experience. Students want that. They, they want to, I think, couple that with some kind of vibrant, as robust as possible on campus, in-person experience. They need something. Uh, and they're tired of being home and we are too. And um, so we got to figure out a way uh, to, to do both now. I, I would maybe just circle back to my comments earlier and the, this sort of ongoing reminder that our, our students who are most susceptible to injury through this pandemic are going to be those students who are low income and first in their family to go to college and students of color. We know that. And, and I think it needs to guide our work in some regards. <laughs> as we move forward. So, you know, just maintaining that online delivery and distance education and um, more flexible, all, all of these things are part of the conversation, but recognizing some of our students walk into college with a lot more tools in their toolkit and a lot more experience in order to be successful in those modalities than others. And, and we've got to keep that in mind as we head into this. So it is, you know, we've, we've talked about some of the finances about this and I, and they're, they're vital, but the reality is there is a huge social cost to us of not getting our students back in the classroom in some way, shape, or form, right? Even if it's in a flexible format, there's gonna be a cost to us. So, you know, as we, you know, this is gonna come up, but are, are these institutions trying to get back to in-person learning just for their bottom line? And the answer is, it's gonna cost us money either way. I mean, to Dr. Hunter, you, your point is right. It's gonna cost us a huge amount of money to do this safely with cleaning and testing and all these things. It's gonna cost us money either way. So what is the social and moral cost of, um, of what we do or don't do this fall? And I think that maybe is the more central question. Thank you. Um, and we've, we've touched a little bit too, just on broader finances and um, the financial implications to the campus. When we think though about 
um, American higher education um, and realistically what might happen um, across our, our collective system. Are we potentially looking at um, consolidations or closures of campuses in the next few years? Um, what are institutions doing to rethink maybe some of those models? I know, Jeff, you've done a little bit of surveying and, and trend spotting on this. We'd love to hear from, from you on that. Yeah, so I, I think that we may see some acceleration of some closures uh, and mergers, which we would have seen anyway. Um, I, I tend to think it's incredibly hard uh, to close a, a campus, particularly a, a public campus. And I think particularly after or during this pandemic, when we see a lot of job losses, I think some lawmakers, even if they want to cut higher ed, are going to be loath to want to close campuses because of the impact that has on, on local uh, communities. So I think where we will see a lot more consolidation and closure, I think, are those institutions that tend to be smaller, more in the private sector, more in places where there was already going to be decline, particularly of traditional age students, so in the Midwest and in the Northeast. Where I think we might see some more innovation um, is, is some of the stuff that just came out of, uh, my, my home state is Pennsylvania, so I've been paying a lot of attention to what's been happening in the PASHI system there, the Pennsylvania higher education system led by uh, Dan Greenstein, formerly of, of Gates. Um, and they're doing a lot of work on rethinking that system. But there is an example, for, uh, for instance, where the state legislature gave them a lot of flexibility, but part of the mandate was you can't close a campus, right? So we can do, they're going to do some consolidation and including, by the way, sharing administrative jobs, which I think is a really smart move, a, a lot around differentiation. So some institutions might be degree completion institutions, some might be uh, online only. That to me is the answer here, right? Instead of what we were doing before the pandemic, where every institution was trying to be like everybody else, uh, I think the answer, particularly in the public sector, where, as I said, it's going to be hard, I think, to close institutions, is to how can we differentiate them to serve the needs of the state um, in a more diverse way? Um, uh, that, to me, is the answer on, on this, is to really look at the needs of the learners, the needs of the states, better match them up, and that will include more differentiation. Now, the institu some institutions might think they are gonna lose out of that deal, um, and that's where I think a strong statewide coordination or strong governor really helps. Uh, I would add that in our last legislative session, we had a resolution that asked the, the Board of Regents to join with the Community Technical College System to look at uh, efficiencies, administrative academic efficiencies in light of COVID. Uh, we've had a number of uh, mergers within consolidations within our community college system. Um, and the real place where they leaned in was to Jeff's point. The system has done a lot of administrative back office efficiency, if you will, but really has not worked as a system on the academic side of the house. And so the report specifically pointed out that you do not move your system as one when it comes to academics, you treat each institution at its, as its own individual silo. So how do you think about um, really harnessing the power of the system when it comes to academic career technical education offerings in a way that allows you to have much more efficiency and much more uh, effectiveness for students? So that is a place where we absolutely will be leaning in. Our state also has a new streamlining government commission that has been formed uh, as a result of COVID. And so I'm sure we'll be in more conversations around uh, efficiencies, effectiveness, size of institutions, number of institutions. Uh, so I, I, I would imagine that will continue, as Jeff has mentioned, to be uh, conversations that are coming and coming soon. Great. Thank you. Very much, Jeff and, and Kim. So I want to end on a on a high note, and I'd like to give each of you an opportunity. I'm going to go back to Jeff's um, sense of optimism, um, but I'm going to offer each of you the opportunity to chime in on what happens next. So it seems difficult to offer any kind of blanket prediction for you know what institutions or higher ed writ large will do this fall, um, but I would love to just hear your parting thoughts on. Uh, we're, we are in the midst of a, a pretty uncertain time, but we're also in the midst of a, a real opportunity um, to rethink and, and I keep saying recalibrate, but um, I strongly believe that. Um, we'd love to hear from each of you. What happens next?
I'm going to call uh, on. I'll start. Okay. Uh, you, were, um, you were actually in my <laughs> corner, so I was about to call on uh, So what happens, um, what happens next? I think a lot of it depends on what is happening here in my hometown of Washington. Allison, as you know, um, Congress is back in town, yeah. uh, which could be good or bad, but there's, they're clearly working on another coronavirus uh, relief bill, which will probably be the last one before the election. Um, what's in there, I think, will be, there, there probably won't be much, if anything, uh, for higher ed, but there's going to be, you know, potentially money for K through 12, unemployment, other, other things that could impact um, higher ed down the, uh, down the road. Um, and I think what happens to states in K through 12 is going to be critical for, for higher ed, um, because, uh, you know, K through 12 is going to a blast a big um, uh, hole in many state budgets. Um, and so the more help that uh, the federal government provides, that could provide perhaps a, a little bit of a relief valve for, for, for higher ed. Um, so I, I'm still worried about the, uh, the financial piece of this for, for colleges and universities, but I'm really excited about some of the things that we've talked about on this call in that um, I think that there have been some changes that have happened very quickly that are gonna stick, um, including hybrid learning, including online learning, including thinking about new audiences for higher ed. So those things really give me hope is that the amount of change in learning that we've been forced to make on the fly in higher ed, I hope the good things really do end up sticking and I think they will. I think if we get through the short-term piece of this, meaning the funding piece of this, I think on the other side, we could have a, um, a very innovative system that might have taken us 10 years and we might now have it in five. Thanks, Jeff. I would agree. I would say that we have urgency and solutions now. Uh, we've learned that the battleship can, can turn in two weeks, right? And so uh, I, I think we've been freed up from this idea that we just can't do it. We just don't move that fast. That's not who we are. Uh, and so I do think that for us in Louisiana, we are assessing what has worked. We're assessing what innovations we'd like to lean into even further and trying to think about what are the tools to get there. You know, one of the things that we've worked on is education workforce uh, alignment conversations and how do we accelerate those conversations? How do we think about not just good citizenship, but occupational forecast and making sure people have good information around career exploration, that high school students understand work-based learning. And so when you really step away and say, what do we need for a system that serves people well, that builds a resilient Louisiana, then when you step into that answer with solutions that are driven from strong alignment and people at the center of the conversation, then I think what can happen next is something very exciting that can move a, a state and its people forward. And so I too am excited about that work. Great, thank you. Paul or John? Well, I'll give it a go. I think what happens next is that uh, educators at all levels rededicate themselves to their work. That is, this time of great challenges compels us to recommit knowing that the work we do is really a contribution to social justice and economic opportunity for our students. It's more important now than ever. So let's keep going. Fantastic. John, you yeah, I, might, I might jump onto that from the student perspective. I, my hope is that this is, um, you know, Paul, you talked about the, the sort of in your mind's eye, you can see the student who's at home and has been for four months and they've lost some independence and they've, I mean, this has really been a difficult time. And my hope is that what comes next is this reminder of what a privilege it is for all of us to come together in these campuses, um, to come together in this really special thing that is American higher education, that there's this great reminder that it's a privilege and it's worth something to all of us. It's worth fighting for, it's worth trying to figure out how we get back um, and, and frankly get a lot better to your point, Jeff. My hope is, and this, came, this question came up, that we're all ready to extend each other an extra measure of respect, uh, an extra measure of care, because you know, recognizing that coming back together is gonna require some of those things. One of the questions about how are you gonna make your students comply, um, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. We've got a whole variety of 
plans in place, but heaven knows. I, I think my hope is that students are in the same place we are about really um, being reminded what a privilege it is and that they, they want it bad enough that they will give up a few concessions to help us pull it off. Great. Well said. Thank you all. You've given us um, a, an hour of your time, which we all know today is um, incredibly valuable. So thank you for coming together, for sharing in this conversation, um, and for sharing your expertise and perspective. Be well, thank you. everyone. Take care.